Japan will host the annual meetings of the International Monetary Fund and World Bank in October. That will be for the first time in 48 years. Just prior to the convention, the government plans to hold an international conference on disaster preparedness. The government will invite participants from 188 IMF and World Bank member nations for the meeting. The delegates will include finance ministers and central bank governors. The conference is scheduled for October 9th and 10th in the northeastern city of Sendai. It was hit hard by the earthquake and tsunami in March last year. Japanese government officials want to inform about the ongoing recovery efforts and share the country's experiences of last year's disaster with other nations. Another focus of the disaster conference will be the situation in developing countries where investments on preparedness have a low priority due to the huge costs. Debates will be held to explore how to achieve disaster preparedness and economic growth at the same time. <laughs> Sometimes just think funny things. Voters in Japan could be heading to the polls this fall. Prime Minister Yoshiko Noda says he will dissolve the diet and call a general election soon after lawmakers enact his financial reform package, which would raise the country's consumption tax. He made the decision after striking an agreement with the two major opposition parties to save the package. We have confirmed two things. Firstly, we will quickly pass the financial reform package based on the three-party agreement. And secondly, we will go to the people soon after the legislation is enacted. The Prime Minister held an evening meeting with the leaders of the Liberal Democratic Party and its partner, New Komeito. The LDP had refused to help Noda pass legislation if he didn't set an election date. Noda wouldn't do that, but he did say once the bills are enacted, he'll be ready to go to the polls. The Prime Minister and his ruling Democratic Party are trying to raise the consumption tax from 5 to 10 percent by 2015 to finance Japan's debt and aging society. They also plan to modify the social security system. He technically doesn't have to hold an election until next summer, but he had staked his political career on hiking the tax, and the opposition forced his hand with threats of no confidence and censure motions. Earlier, Newsline's Gino Tani spoke with NHK World's senior political commentator Masayo Nakajima on this issue. Tell us a little bit more about the meaning behind this agreement. Well, I think with this, Prime Minister Noda will be able to pass and enact uh, his tax hike bill and related legislation soon as scheduled with the help of the main opposition LDP and its ally New Komeito. The opposition LDP once agreed to enact the bill, but later its leaders changed their minds because Noda tried to delay calling an election so his ruling DPJ could stay in power longer. The DPJ has a low public approval rating and the main opposition LDP believes that it would be able to defeat the party if Noda calls an early election. But in the Wednesday meeting, it seems that Noda did not fully compromise with the opposition leader. He only said an election would happen soon. He didn't give an exact date, although voters could head to the polls uh, sometime this fall. As you say, the LDP uh, agreed to cooperate even as Noda didn't give in to their demands. Why was this? Well, the main opposition uh, LDP's leader, Tanigaki, had to be seen to be acting in the best interest of the country. You know, Japan is facing, Japan is in a dire situation. No shit. It carries a greater proportion of debt uh, on its books than in any other developed nation. Mm -hmm. Experts point to Greece as a warning of the need to get the nation's finances in order. Debt as a percentage of gross domestic product in Japan is higher than in any other industrialized nation. On top of that, Japan has one of the highest proportions of, of citizens older than 65. Paying for social security is putting an increasing strain on national finances. 
it has, it has been a, a promise to the world to raise the consumption tax, which is relatively low among wealthy nations. For all these reasons, the main opposition, LDP, had to make compromise. And I think Prime Minister Noda saved face. And this country, Japan, would be able to avoid losing trust from international society and investors. Dr. Shuntaro Hida has been fighting against an invisible enemy for much of his life, and at 95 years old, he's still fighting. Hida survived the Hiroshima atomic bombing, and he treated about 6,000 other survivors until he retired three years ago. He spoke tirelessly about the dangers of radiation, especially internal exposure. Now, that's different from external exposure. That refers to radiation penetrating the body from the outside. It's what happened to many residents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki when the atomic bombs exploded and released extremely strong rays. Internal exposure, on the other hand, refers to the effects of absorbing radioactive particles by breathing or by ingesting contaminated food. Some experts say low doses of radiation do not pose serious health risks. But Dr. Hina and others maintain radioactive particles can destroy cells, alter DNA, and cause all sorts of illnesses. 67 years after the atomic bombings, Hida's warnings are attracting new attention. Shuntaro Hida visits this place every August 6. It's one of the memorials in Hiroshima for the victims of the atomic bombing. The experience of the atomic bomb was a special and a big issue in my life. It changed my view of life as a doctor. In 1945, Hida was serving as a Nami doctor in Hiroshima. Hida was exposed to radiation, but he still worked tirelessly treating survivors in the aftermath. He was surprised when he started seeing patients who had escaped the blast but had returned to the city days later. They were also dying of acute radiation syndrome, showing symptoms such as high fever, hair loss, and bleeding. Hida watched over the years as more survivors developed cancer and other diseases. Authorities restricted reporting of A-bomb health damage for several years after the war. So it wasn't until the 1970s that Hida realized his patients were likely suffering from internal radiation exposure. In Hiroshima, radiation killed human beings for the first time. Still now, the nature of the radiation damage cannot be understood from a medical point of view nor can it be treated. Hida dedicated his life to educating people about the long-term health damage radiation can cause. He delivered speeches around the world. Then last year's accident at Fukushima Daiichi gave him a new focus. Many people in Japan wanted to hear his message. Parents in particular they worry radiation from the damaged plant could harm their children. Yoko Hashimoto is a mother of two living in Tokyo. My children grow up with what I give them to eat, and I feel horrified about the possible effect on them. Hashimoto and a group of mothers turned to Hida so they could be better informed. Hida explained how atomic bomb victims became sick. He also criticized politicians and experts who say the radiation released by Fukushima Daiichi poses no risk. Internal radiation exposure is indeed dangerous. Once you absorb even a low dose, it will cause damage. We experience this horror many times after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
He that told mothers that many A bomb survivors tried hard to prevent being sick by taking every measure to maintain good health. You should spend the rest of your life working together to shut down nuclear plants and abolish nuclear weapons. I will think about how not to be a victim of radiation. Dr. Hida has delivered more than 150 speeches since the Fukushima nuclear accident. There is no other surviving doctor who can speak about the damage from radiation exposure. The government and other elites say that people don't need to worry about internal exposure. But I've seen evidence to the contrary. I have to speak about it even though it's hard at times. The 95-year-old says he's committed to teaching the next generation the lessons of the past and reminding them of the dangers they face in the present. A sinister question surrounding radiation is how much damage it can pass on from parents to children. A scientist in Osaka is trying to find out. The focus of the study is children born to South Korean Hibakusha, the name for survivors of uh, the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A group of second-generation Hibakusha is working with a team led by Taisei Nomura, professor emeritus of radiology at Osaka University. They're trying to find out whether their illnesses are linked to their parents' radiation exposure. The study will also uh, the study will involve analysis of blood samples from atomic bomb survivors and their children to determine what effects of exposure have been passed on. <laughs> I hope this study will help second-generation Hibaksha gain official recognition as victims of the atomic bombings. About 10,000 second-generation Hibaksha are living in South Korea. Some claim their leukemia and arthritis are the result of their parents' exposure to radiation. The study group hopes the research will improve their lives. In Japan, the offspring of Hibaksha receive regular health checks and welfare support, but those in South Korea are not entitled to such benefits. Experts at the Japan-U.S. organization Radiation Effects Research Foundation in Hiroshima say the genetic impact of the atomic bombings has yet been determined. And there's these guys. We took them camping for fun. It's another bullshit experiment. Russian prosecutors have demanded a three-year prison sentence for members of a female rock band. The women sang a protest song against President Vladimir Putin at a church in February. The three-member band Pussy Riot was charged with hooliganism. They performed the song in a Russian Orthodox church in Moscow before the presidential election. Prosecutors said on Tuesday a loud performance at a church undermines social order and is against social norms. The defendants pleaded not guilty, saying they were simply trying to express their political opinion. The Russian Orthodox Church is close to the Putin administration and is demanding severe punishment. U.S. pop singer Madonna defended the band when she visited Russia. She said what happened to them is unfair. Human rights groups have expressed anger over the case. Anti-government protesters have been given large fines since Putin's return to the presidency in May. A new law also outlines harsh penalties for defamation of political figures. Japan's financial regulators have urged the Tokyo Stock Exchange to prevent system failures from happening again. That's after a technical glitch temporarily left traders unable to buy or sell any derivatives on Tuesday. The Financial Services Agency called on the exchange to explain the cause of the system trouble and report on measures to preventing a recurrence. On Tuesday morning, a technical problem disabled trading of various financial products. They included futures contracts for government bonds and the topic stock index. The stoppage lasted for about an hour and a half. The exchange says a data processing device broke down and a backup machine failed to take over automatically. The board says it will need more time to identify the cause.
go to the remix button hit the remix button that way you'll have this video otherwise you know YouTube's just going to control us guys and it's, it's really bad Tokyo Electric Power Company executives have bowed to pressure and released some of the most important evidence from the early days of Japan's nuclear disaster. They've unveiled videos that document the efforts to deal with the meltdowns and explosions at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. TEPCO officials show the recordings to the media Monday. Select journalists will now be able to watch 150 hours of edited tape from March 11th to 16th, 2011. It tracks the back and forth conversations between workers at the nuclear plant and personnel at headquarters. TEPCO also released 90 minutes of edited video. The videos show workers struggling to contain the accident after the plant lost all power sources. A series of hydrogen explosions in the early days of the disaster confused them. Company executives were also puzzled about the government's intervention in the crisis. TEPCO officials banned reporters from making their own recordings of the videos. They haven't said if they will release video from after March 16th. NHK World's Yoichiro Tateiwa joins us and has been following this story. So tell us about the significance of this video. Jeez. Well, TEPCO's telecom conference is the only remaining record of communication between workers at the plant and employees at the company headquarters. The video begins at around 6.30 p.m. on March 11th. It goes on to record critical conversations that reflect how decisions were made and how the situation changed from time to time. Now, the accident happened more than a year and a half ago. Why did it take TEPCO officials so long to release this video? Basically, they didn't want to release them. Mm -hmm. They hadn't disclosed the videos even existed. We found out about the recordings in March through the course of an investigation into the accident by a diet appointed panel. NHK and other media repeatedly made requests for access to the videos, but TEPCO officials have refused until now. They said the videos are internal records and they cited concern about the privacy of their employees. They finally re agreed to re release the recordings from the five days from March 11th. They edited the image to prevent individuals from being identified. How are people reacting to TEPCO's reluctance to release these videos related to the disaster? Experts say all records should be under public control, even if access is limited. The Tatsuya Yoshioka is the head of a Japanese NGO calling for the abolition of nuclear plants. Here's what he had to say. This is the kind of very important historical the document, the record. I hope the TEPCO themselves to decide to open up more and more and more, as much as possible, transparency. And at the same time, that I would like to ask to the Japanese government that to make a pressure to them to release all the information. The TEPCO shareholders uh, suing the company's executives filed a petition for the videos to be preserved as evidence. They fear, they fear that the utility may erase the, the recording. The proving to the causes of the accident is not finished. These videos will surely be needed for the investigation. The government should take action to preserve all records rel related to the ac the, this incident in the public archive. All right. The divide among Japanese lawmakers over the country's nuclear policy is delaying parliamentary hearings on the investigation report on the Fukushima accident. The Diet-appointed panel of experts last month submitted the report to both chambers of parliament. In the report, the panel criticized both regulators and the plant operator, Tokyo Electric Power Company, for failing to take steps to prevent the disaster. 
It called the accident an obviously man-made disaster. Some opposition parties have called for testimony by panel chair Kiyoshi Kurokawa. He's a former chairman of the Science Council of Japan. An appeal was also made at a recent meeting attended by heads of both cham chambers of the Diet and members of the expert panel. Participants proposed that a standing committee be established in the Diet promptly to discuss nuclear issues based on proposals made in the panel's report. But hearings are unlikely to be held any time soon. Political parties are at odds over more immediate nuclear issues, such as whether to resume nuclear power generation. Most of Japan's reactors are now offline. Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihiko Noda is gearing up for a fight to stay in power. Seven opposition parties are joining forces to submit a no-confidence motion against him. They're trying to block passage of a bill to raise the consumption tax. Your party, Communist and Socialist Democratic, uh, Social Democratic Party leaders, met Friday and invited four other parties to co-sponsor the no-confidence motion. They intend to submit it before the upper house takes a vote on the consumption tax bill. Noda's ruling Democratic Party pushed the legislation through the lower house late last month. Political heavyweight Ichiro Ozawa left the DPJ to protest against the bill and formed his own party. Prime Minister Noda has staked his career on raising the consumption tax. He's vowing to stand his ground. If the motion is submitted, we will do our best to defeat it. Analysts say it will be difficult to pass a no-confidence motion without the backing of the two main opposition parties. The Liberal Democratic Party and New Komeito have so far cooperated with the Prime Minister and his party, but they're threatening to change their stance if the government doesn't hold that consumption tax bill vote next week. A grandson of former U.S. President Harry Truman has met a survivor of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. Truman authorized the use of atomic bombs on that city and Nagasaki in 1945. Daniel will attend the peace memorial ceremony in Hiroshima on Monday. August 6th is a day people in Hiroshima will never forget. In 1945, the U.S. bomber Enola Gay dropped an atomic bomb on their city. People stopped again on the 67th anniversary to remember. The mayor recounted the stories of survivors, and he reminded people about the dangers of nuclear power. Matsui asked the Japanese government to reconsider nuclear power after the crisis at Fukushima Daiichi. I call on the Japanese government to establish without delay an energy policy that guards the safety and the security of its people. Last month, Prime Minister Yoshihiko Noda decided to restart the plant in central Japan. He told the crowd the country would reduce its dependence on nuclear energy in the long term. And he said people across Japan bear the responsibility of sharing the story of Hiroshima. The government, for its part, will continue to appeal for the importance of a world without nuclear weapons. And it will continue to support, in many ways, the activities to hand down the memories of survivors across national borders and generations. Survivors are dying one by one, and many of their stories are dying with them. The UN High Representative for Disarmament Affairs says the use of nuclear weapons is increasingly seen as a violation of human rights. One of the most pressing issues still unresolved after last year's tsunami in Japan is what to do about the tons of debris washed into the ocean. A Japanese survey team has left for the United States where it hopes to come up with ideas to deal with the flotsam now washing up on the west coast of North America. The nine-member team includes experts and volunteers from the Tokyo-based Japan Environmental Action Network and Environment Ministry staff. During their three-day stay in the state of Oregon, they will visit coastal areas where debris has drifted ashore. They will meet U.S. non-governmental groups to learn what is needed in the cleanup effort. About 1.5 million tons of wreckage is believed to have been washed into the Pacific after the March 11th disaster. We want to use this occasion to share experiences and ideas with the residents living along the coast. We will then decide what is needed before moving on with actual measures. 
U.S. and Canadian officials are now trying to get rid of debris that is increasingly showing up on beaches. Countries from which such debris is generated are not required by international law to remove the flotsam. However, the Japanese government decided to send the mission because of the assistance offered by the United States and other countries after the tsunami. Following the accident in Fukushima, many people in Japan have come to rethink the country's dependence on nuclear power. The government proposed three options to decide energy dependency by 2030 from 0 percent, 15 percent, and 20 to 25 percent. The Japanese government held public hearings across the country to solicit views on these three options to decide future energy policy. Government officials heard from people in 11 locations across the country, and they often heard the same thing. 70 percent of participants are backing the zero percent option for Japan's new energy policy. That means utilities would stop producing nuclear power by 2030. The accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant was an eye-opener for many people in Japan. The meltdowns, explosions, and radiation leaks shook a long-held faith in atomic energy. Tens of thousands of people still can't return to their homes near the facility. And crews are still trying to control the plant and prepare it for the multi-billion dollar decommissioning process. But we feel the government has been failing to provide appropriate information. Distrust of its activities is growing. Skepticism is growing too. People wonder how the government will reflect public opinion and the new energy policy. One official admits it will be challenging. It's difficult to see 
which kind of opinion is more important, opinions expressed at the hearings or results of opinion polls? The Japanese government planned to decide on the energy policy by the end of this month, but with support growing for the 0% nuclear power option, it is considering postponing that deadline.核燃料サイクルはどうしても必要なのか原発以外にエネルギーの選択肢はないのか東京大学に原子力専門の科学者を訪ねました。まだらめ春樹教授は政府の原子力政策を決める原子力委員のメンバーの一人です。イエスの方
Medical experts say it will also be difficult to determine if radioactive material released during the nuclear crisis harmed residents in Fukushima or elsewhere. What the fuck? Medical experts say it will also be difficult to determine if radioactive material released during the nuclear crisis harmed residents in Fukushima or elsewhere. I would like to explain something historical to better your understanding. Japan used to be ruled by a king, the emperor. Even in this 21st century, the concept of individual rights as a citizens compared to the West may seem kind of shallow and not ingrained into us yet. Parents and teachers used to tell children the best thing you could do was to die for the country. Kamikaze pirates in the war embodied this uh, Japanese spirit. In World War II, they always told us that we were winning every battle. No one knew about Okinawa, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's exactly the same now. The current government that is not telling people what is happening is the same as we have had since World War II. In Japan's history, one of the highest ideas is to kill all of one's emotions. The government knows this. Japanese people are not used to protesting or speaking back. Keep your country alive by killing yourself. I think the way to save the children at Fukushima is to get the world involved. If we don't protect our children now, it will be too late when we are the second Chernobyl. Not allowing the children to escape is a murder. People from across Japan are getting their chance to weigh in on how they feel about nuclear energy and what role it might play in their future. The government launched a series of public hearings on energy policy, the latest held in Fukushima. Residents there and elsewhere want to know what will happen to nuclear power. NHK World's Mitsuko Nishikawa reports. Fukushima clearly showed that nuclear power can get out of control when something goes wrong. I think that's the lesson all of us have learned. Government officials have heard from the public before, but they've never heard what they heard here. People express their fears about nuclear power. Fears they saw realized at Fukushima Daiichi. Fukushima Prefecture is the ninth location to host a public hearing on the future of Japan's energy policy. Government officials want to gauge people's opinions on nuclear power. They presented participants with three options. The first is known as the zero percent option. It proposes eliminating nuclear power by 2030. The second would have nuclear power provide 15% of the country's energy. Under the third option, Japan would return to the same nuclear power reliance as before the accident, between 20 and 25%. Many residents criticized government officials for how they managed previous hearings. Some of the speakers at those meetings stood up in favor of nuclear power. It turns out they were, in fact, employees of electric utilities. The officials changed their protocol in Fukushima. They banned utility employees and tripled the number of speakers. Do you need the sort of energy that sacrifices the lives of people who work at the plant? Numbers are not what we're talking about here. I hope that as much of our intelligence as possible can be used for the development of the best technology for generating renewable natural energy. Others asked whether government leaders would even consider the suggestions in making decisions. I hope future policy reflects our opinion. They're just letting us vent frustration. Government officials will wrap up these public hearings this week. 
they've heard unprecedented opposition to nuclear power, and that seems to be growing. Many want to know whether government leaders will take such opinions into account when they define Japan's new energy policy. One of Japan's political heavyweights has proposed scrapping all the nation's nuclear power plants in 10 years. Ichiro Ozawa defected from the ruling Democratic Party and launched a new party last month. In a news conference on Wednesday, he unveiled the party's key policies. Ozawa said that kokumin no seikatsu ga daiichi, or people's lives first, will promote technologies for energy conservation and renewables. He also rejected the Democrats' consumption tax hike, saying it would deal a heavy blow to small businesses and people working in farming, forestry and fisheries. He said those industries are not strong enough. Ozawa pledged that the party would grant a total of about $500 billion in government subsidies and funds to provincial governments to implement its policies. In a fresh sign of disaster recovery, fishermen of Kushima Prefecture have sent octopus for sale to markets in Tokyo and Nagoya. It's their first shipment to large cities since last year's nuclear accident. The fishermen shipped some 200 kilograms of octopus caught more than 50 kilometers away from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Fishing around Fukushima for three kinds of marine products on a trial basis resumed in June following a voluntary 15-month suspension. On a trial basis, Resumed in June following a voluntary 15-month suspension. The catch has been sold in Fukushima and neighboring Miyagi Prefecture as no radiation has been detected so far. As no radiation has been detected so far. Imano. We look forward to seeing what consumers in big cities far away really think about produce from Fukushima. The octopus shipped to Tokyo will be sold on Thursday at the Tsukiji Fish Market. Survivors of the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki often say they're afraid the world will forget. Now, the United Nations has published some of their stories, subtitled in 11 languages. The online project was organized after UN Secretary General Pan Ki-moon called for preserving their testimonies for younger generations. The project's website features 12 people now living in the Americas. Their stories are subtitled in English, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese and other languages. Kaoru Ito, a resident of Sao Paulo, Brazil, says that only those who saw the devastation after the bombings can really understand the evil of atomic weapons. There are no A-bomb survivors around me because I am now 90 years old. But I feel the need to tell my story to young people so that future generations will not forget. UN officials in charge of the project say they hope it will help create a world free of nuclear weapons. Five hundred days have now passed since the Fukushima nuclear crisis in Japan began, and one thing's clear: it's still an extremely dangerous situation. Japanese newspapers reporting the plant operators still face a number of hurdles before they can decommission the plant and officially close the book on the crisis, and it could take decades. One of those hurdles includes trying to determine why eight million becquerels of radioactive cesium still continues to pour out of reactor number two every single hour. And plant operators still have no clue how they're going to remove massive pools of highly radioactive spent fuel from the roofs of the reactors. As the newspaper reports, not only will that work be unprecedented, but the work will also have to be done in an environment of high radiation levels. Oh, and then there's the situation with Reactor 4, which could collapse at any moment, triggering a worldwide nuclear disaster worse than Chernobyl. 
For more on this, let's turn it over to Carl Grossman, investigative reporter and professor of journalism at the State University of New York and author of the book, Cover Up, What You Are Not Supposed to Know About Nuclear Power. We're now 500 days since the crisis began. Just how big of a mess is Fukushima still? Uh, it's, it's an ongoing disaster, right? a catastrophe, a catastrophe for the people and other life in Japan, a catastrophe for people and other life all over the globe. Uh, the radiation is still streaming out of the Fukushima Daiichi complex. It's been going on for, as you say, 500 days. The consequences, we're talking about grave impacts. And a point I'd like to make, which mainstream media just have not touched in all these many months, the Coke and Pepsi of nuclear power worldwide, historically, General Electric and Westinghouse, 80% of nuclear power plants worldwide are manufactured or designed by either General Electric or Westinghouse. What happened in 2009? Well, a company called Toshiba bought Westinghouse, and later in 2009, a company called Hitachi partnered with General Electric in its nuclear division. So now the, the Coke and Pepsi of nuclear power worldwide are basically Japanese brands. Amazing. Which amazing. has given Carl, the Carl, we're, up, in we're, out, we're out of time, but I, it, it, that's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thank it could take years for engineers to figure out exactly what caused the accident at Fukushima Daiichi. High radiation levels are keeping them from accessing parts of the plant. Different teams investigating the disaster have come up with their own conclusions. A government plan panel released its report just this week. We're going to look at how the various findings compare on today's nuclear watch, and we'll also examine the debate over whether the accident was preventable. The March 11th earthquake and tsunami caused serious damage to Fukushima Daiichi. A full-scale loss of power triggered meltdowns in three reactors. The crisis revealed the failures Tokyo Electric Power Company and nuclear regulators made before the accident and while it was ongoing. Discussion on whether the disaster was preventable has yet to run its course. TEPCO concluded in its report released in June, a tsunami beyond expectations caused the accident. It insisted the event was unpreventable. On the other hand, members of a diet-appointed panel stressed this month in their report the accident was man-made. They concluded if preventive measures had been taken before 2011, the accident might not have happened. NHK World's Hiroshi Yokokawa has been following this story. So Hiroshi, TEPCO analysts say the accident was not preventable, whereas experts on the diet panel say the accident was actually man-made. What do members of the government-appointed committee say? They say it was difficult to predict tsunami. But they criticized TEPCO for not taking preventive measures mm. before the accident, based on research into the possibility of a big tsunami. They also say TEPCO lacked a sense of urgency and imagination, and was not proactive as a result. The committee says a safety myth blinded TEPCO executives. It says they believed a serious accident could not happen, so they did not educate and train employees to deal with worst-case scenarios. Members of the committee also criticize Japan's nuclear safety agency. They say regulators failed to fulfill their mission to review disaster control measures at nuclear plants. The Diet Commission says it wasn't just the tsunami that damaged Fukushima Daiichi. Actually, the earthquake might have played a role. If that's true, the operators uh, and regulators would have to review the ability of nuclear plants to withstand quakes. Uh, what does the government committee report say on this matter? The committee looked at the radiation and pressure levels in the containment vessels between the start of the earthquake and the time the tsunami hit. It says the damage before the tsunami was not serious enough to release radioactive substances. But investigators did not define the damage caused by the earthquake and the damage caused by the tsunami. More analysis on this key point is needed. The diet and government panels will be disbanded. What are the prospects for further investigation? And no decision has been made. Members of both panels are calling for the government to continue the investigation. 
調査、そういうものをやらなきゃいけないって言ったのが一番大きいのは、これは起こった We said the investigation must carry on because the accident is still ongoing. We can't believe an investigation that requires observation for a long period of time should be thrown to its end. A government official told us they are considering establishing a department for the investigation in the new regulation agency, which is going to start in September. There are still more questions than answers. When it comes to the nuclear disaster, we will keep following the investigation and evaluations. The meltdowns and explosions at Fukushima Daiichi last year released radiation over a wide area. Crews have been decontaminating parts of northeastern Japan, but they're only now tackling one of the toughest jobs. Some of the residential areas that were once part of the 20 kilometer no go zone surrounding the nuclear plant. Crews got started Friday in Tamura. The government reclassified the city in April, allowing people to be there during the day. More than 2,500 residents are still barred from permanently returning to their homes. Workers started by gathering leaves and cutting brush at shrines and graveyards in the area. Residents want these areas decontaminated first so they can visit family graves during the Buddhist Bon holidays in August. Some of them joined in the work. I feel a little anxious, but I want to cooperate as much as possible. Someone needs to do it. The Environment Ministry hopes to decontaminate 400 houses, along with 420 hectares of farmland and forests, by the end of March. The government hasn't decided a date for when residents can return home. More than half of these municipal governments have yet to come up with their own decontamination plans. The biggest obstacle is finding temporary storage sites. Finding places to stockpile the contaminated soil and other waste is proving to be a major challenge. Our ministry will handle it responsibly. The government expects the decontamination work in all 11 municipalities to be completed by the end of March 2014, with the exception of some highly radioactive areas. Japan's government has warned that the disaster hit northeast is facing an unprecedented population decline. The government's annual economic report released on Friday said that about 40,000 more people moved out of the three worst hit prefectures than moved in during last year. The situation in Fukushima Prefecture since the March 11th disaster is especially serious due to the impact of the nuclear accident at the Daiichi plant. Now, the report also says the number of students who hope to find jobs outside these prefectures has grown by about 30%, while significantly fewer want to stay. The report calls for stepped up reconstruction efforts, warning that a plummeting population could undermine the foundations of the regional economy. Thousands of people in Japan are on the front lines of a fight against an invisible enemy. They're cleaning up the radiation that leaked and is still leaking from Fukushima Daiichi. Some of them work at the damaged nuclear plant and others in the towns and cities surrounding it. Either way, they all rely on one key piece of equipment and the people who shrugged off health fears to stay in northeastern Japan to make it. NHK World's Junior Tsumoto has the story. Hundreds of thousands of workers are part of the cleanup operation in Fukushima. Radiation could be anywhere. So, they are required to wear plenty of protective gear boots, gloves, and thick clothing. Masks are also part of their work wardrobe. They could make the difference between staying healthy and getting sick. We cannot go without masks. The meltdowns and explosions at Fukushima Daiichi released a massive amount of radiation into the environment. Decontamination crews use disposable masks. Workers at the plant have more durable varieties. 
That's created a booming mask-making business in Japan. Suppliers have been racing to keep up with demand. The manufacturer that's leading the way is located here. Atsuo Futami is in charge of the factory, which the earthquake partially damaged. It produces about 90% of protective masks used at nuclear plants across Japan, including Fukushima Daiichi. Demand increased five-fold after March 11, 2011, to 300,000 masks a month. If we didn't supply masks, workers at the plant wouldn't be able to work to contain the nuclear accident. If the accident cannot be contained, that would put all of Japan at risk, I thought. Futami faced a dilemma because he didn't know if it was even safe to be in the factory. It's outside the evacuation zone surrounding Fukushima Daiichi, but he's still worried his 100 workers could be exposed to radiation. If their work wasn't making masks, they would have wanted to evacuate to a safer place because we had no information about the radiation. Jun, you showed us one example of a Fukushima company making the best of the bad situation in the prefecture. How have other businesses responded to the nuclear crisis? Some are also benefiting. For example, workers need to use special bags to store contaminated soil. Local authorities who buy those bags are giving priority to Fukushima manufacturers. Local businesses are also expected to get contracts when it comes time to haul contaminated soil to storage facilities. As of now, authorities have not decided where to put those facilities. It seems firms in Fukushima will dominate the decontamination work. It's something of a mixed blessing, but it looks like the disaster will create jobs in the prefecture. How is the government helping with the recovery effort then? Prime Minister Yoshihiko Noda's cabinet approved a basic plan on July 13th to rebuild Fukushima. He wants to stop people from leaving the prefecture and promote reconstruction. The plan clearly states the government is responsible for allowing utilities to build nuclear power plants in Fukushima. So it said the government will do everything it can to rebuild the prefecture and people there need help. Fukushima officials say the prefecture's main farm products, such as cucumbers, broccoli, and rice, only bring in, bring in about 70 to 90 percent of pre-disaster prices. It will take a long time before Fukushima will be back to what it was before March 11, 2011. Touring the prefecture, I realized the um, revitalizing the economy isn't just about the government plans or the promotion of local products. The key lies in the sense of responsibility and love residents have for their home.